Stuart Uzi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I uh, say I probably wouldn't agree with the conclusion reached by the right honourable gentleman from Mid Sussex, but it was a pleasure to hear that speech. Uh, I know that the Chancellor has had to go to a Cabinet committee meeting. I suspect there may be a number of those between now and next Tuesday, so I understand why he's not in his place. Uh, but I would like to say uh, I agree with them in one particular regard, that to have no deal and to revert to WTO rules uh, would be the, best po uh, the worst possible outcome uh, we could reach. Uh, I would also say that I thought he was incredibly sincere uh, when he said that not to agree with the Prime Minister's uh, arrangements with this withdrawal deal uh, would fracture society. Uh, I've got absolutely no doubt with the sincerity with which he said that. Uh, but I think as a Democrat, I say no less sincerely uh, when the circumstances change and the actual consequences of that which we may embark upon becomes clear. We have a right to change our minds in whatever that means to any individual. Mr Speaker, I, uh, I wish to restrict my remarks mainly to issues of trade, investment and migration as the reduction in trade, investment and the reduction in migration due to an ending of uh, free movement of people are the main drivers for what will be a reduction in GDP growth, reduced productivity and living standards for citizens. Uh, because unless one views this as some kind of nationalistic project, surely to goodness it is the economy and changes and the impact on the economy and how it impacts on citizens that should be our primary concern. Uh, the first thing I would say is in relation to this decision to end free movement, as the Prime Minister says, once and for all. All of the Brexit scenarios modelled by the Treasury show GDP in 15 years' time to be lower, and lower still when the impact of ending free movement is modelled. So it is time to stop pretending the ending free movement is a good thing. It is not. It is self-evidently economically damaging. An attempt to mitigate some of that. I have read the withdrawal agreement in detail. The section on mobility. The mobility arrangements will be based on non-discrimination. That is good. The freedom of movement will no longer apply. They will wish to negotiate short-term visits exchanges for study, training and youth exchanges. They will consider social security issues. They will explore the possibility of facilitating the crossing of respective borders for legitimate travel. That means it will not exist on day one. They will allow travel in terms of international family law, offer judicial cooperation and matrimonial parental responsibility and the like. And it then goes on to say in para 59, these arrangements will be in addition to the commitments of temporary entry and stays in relation to section 3 of this document, and those are limited areas. Now, I'll come back to that in terms of agriculture. I don't want anyone to think this agreement will allow effectively travel as it currently exists. It simply will not. Now, Mr Speaker, all of the serious pre-referendum assessments, every one of the serious assessments, of the likely impact were negative. They were almost all in the minus 2 to minus 9 per cent GDP range over the forecast periods which they looked at. Even the OECD central estimate, I think, was 5 per cent loss of GDP over their forecast period. The subsequent cross Whitehall analysis suggested the following. The GDP was 1.5 per cent lower in 15 years under an EEA type scenario. 4.8% lower under a free trade agreement scenario and 7.7% lower under a mitigated WTO type scenario. And it's worth noting that even that final scenario was based on a smooth, orderly no deal exit, not a disruptive cliff edge Brexit. And it's no surprise, therefore, that the Bank of England Brexit analysis shows GDP growth lowest unemployment highest and inflation steeply upward, the more disorderly the Brexit. The figures for Scotland, pre-referendum on a WTO's, WTO rules outcome, 
suggested GDP down 5 per cent, real wages down 7 per cent, and employment, employment down 80,000 jobs, around 3 per cent. Since the withdrawal agreement has been published, there have been further assessments referenced today. Uh, NISA have suggested GDP growth reduced by £100 billion a year. Uh, the LSE suggesting GDP being lower again in the minus 2 to minus 9 per cent range. And the Scottish Government demonstrating an FTA agreement, showing GDP down around £9 billion, the equivalent of £1,600 per person. I will happily give way. Is there anything positive or um, hopeful he could announce in his speech? Because this just sounds like continuity project fear. The, this, have a fantasy. This, is the, this is actually the problem with this debate. There have been a series of assessments, almost universally identical, from dozens of different organisations, yet some people, and I want to keep the tenor of this careful, but some people have ignored all expert opinion. This has been a gut instinct reaction, and that's what we're going to deliver. By sheer force of will, things will be better. Magic. I think Magic. it was. Im- uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think it's important, and this is why I've laid this out in this way today, uh, to demonstrate that from the start of this exercise, pre referendum, between the referendum and the withdrawal agreement, Absolutely. and since the withdrawal agreement, the expert opinion tells us one thing. Now, the Honourable Lady is perfectly at liberty to disagree with her. She might come back in 5, 10, 15 or 20 years and say, I told you so, it wasn't that bad. But if we go in blindly to something as substantive and perhaps irrevocable as this and get it wrong, then the public will never forgive us. And I'll, I'll, I'll give way. I'll give way. Thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way. Uh, he makes the point about, quite properly, that a number of uh, economic expert opinions all say much the same thing. But, of course, this is exactly the same as was the case before the referendum. And, uh, and I said, I will repeat, they, they may not like the facts, but I will repeat the facts to them. Exactly the same as would be true in the case before the referendum. And the government's forecast was in the middle of those expert opinions. And the outcome was approximately £100 billion out in the first two years after the referendum. So there is a reason to say these experts may be all talking within a hall of mirrors. I, I don't doubt that some of the assessments given for what might have happened to date before we leave were wrong. I was very clear from the outset of the referendum that nothing would happen. My personal view, nothing would happen in the first couple of years. Indeed, even after we leave, I don't think the impact is going to be immediate. But when we look at FDI decisions, big ones, taking a decision on a billion pound investment to access a market of 500 million or an access of 70 million, I suspect at that point we'll begin to see some very uh, substantial uh, and negative consequences for the UK economy. And I'll, I'll give you one more time, then I'll make some points. I, I thank Honourable Friend for giving way. He's being very generous with his time. But does all of this not prove that it stands to reason that the best possible relationship with the European Union must be membership? If this deal was, having, was going to be so beneficial for the UK economy, everybody else would want that deal, and the whole European Union project would implode. That is simply <laughs> not possible and demonstrates that no matter what people were voting for, they were not voting to become poorer. Year, year, year. I, I, I think my honourable friend is absolutely right, and I, I'm not going to do it today, but certainly in previous debates, uh, we have gone through quote after quote after quote from Brexiteers who said, well, we wouldn't be leaving the customs union. We wouldn't be leaving the single market. Uh, we'd still have the right to travel freely throughout Europe. Uh, because not everybody voted for a Brexit that was based on any single assessment damaging the economy, living standards and opportunities for their children and grandchildren. And the last of the assessments, Mr Speaker, is the most recent government one, which again shows the central forecast in all circumstances, broadly in the minus 2 to minus 9 per cent range. And the thing, not at the, not, not at the moment, not at the moment, because I find it extraordinary that this government, in essence, have ignored every single serious assessment of the economic damage Brexit will do. And what we see now with this proposal on this withdrawal agreement is like rabbits caught in headlights, walking 
towards walking the economy towards danger uh, rather than pausing, thinking and changing course. And I, 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 I'll give way. Wait, I just wanted to take you up on an, on an earlier comment. I'm sorry? was giving way to the Honourable Member from the Scottish constituency. But no, 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 fair enough, Mr Richard Graham. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask with him, he said earlier that bringing to an end free movement would be very damaging. What would he say to my constituent, a young Gloucester girl, eight months pregnant, badly beaten up by her European boyfriend, who is terrified, terrified that when he comes out of prison, he will return to haunt her and her family because this country cannot deport European nationals unless they have served a sentence of longer than two years. Does he agree that there are some elements where actually would be protective, not damaging? Uh, I, I'm reluctant to get into an individual case. Suffice to say this. We all are constituents with the same young lady who may have been assaulted by a man from the same town who live two streets away. Nationality and the ability to travel in that circumstance, however difficult, is actually irrelevant. And I'll give way. My honourable, the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. The point he was making previous to my Honourable Friend's intervention was just one about looking at economic futures and the government facing facts where growth could be less than expected. Does he not see the irony of the SNP MPs making this point when, of course, reports have clearly stated that Scotland, were it be separated, would face 25 years of austerity? But keeping in his more consensual tone in the chamber, I would just say that when he's quoting GDP figures and the minus or plus addition or, or subtraction, can you just be clear to the House, because I think it's very important for all those watching, that it is that growth will be less than it was forecast. Growth will still happen, but it will be less rather than none at all. I have been absolutely clear that these figures are against the baseline. That is absolutely correct. These are figures where GDP is lower than would otherwise have been the case. Now, Mr Speaker, the language of the political declaration is about negotiating a future relationship. If we set aside the way in which that's been dressed up in some kind of form of exceptionalism that we're going to have the best deal ever, we are in essence talking about no more or no less than the vague intention to start to negotiate what the government hopes will be a preferential free trade agreement. But the vulnerability of our economy to Brexit cannot be adequately mitigated through a UK-EU FTA, and that is, in essence, all we're talking about. So while, for example, the EU FTA with Canada does include some limited provision for some degree of third country validation, that's aligned with EU regulations in order to facilitate the trade in goods, but it falls substantially short of securing access to the European single market the UK or any EEA member currently enjoys. Absolutely. So we would argue that continued membership of the European Single Market and the Customs Union is vital to ensure the UK economy continues to benefit from the trading arrangements we fundamentally currently have. Indeed, if, if my memory serves, there was a previous assessment by the National Institute by NISA which demonstrated that retaining single market membership <coughs> could avoid seeing a 60 per cent yes, decline in goods and services exports to the EEA in comparison to an arrangement based on WTO rules. And I'd also add at this point that the current arrangements do not simply facilitate trade with the EU directly. The membership of the EU has, for example, enabled Scotland to benefit from EU FTAs with more than 50 trading partners, so that by 2015, Scotland exported £3.6 billion to countries with which the EU has a free trade agreement, and that trade accounted for 13 per cent of Scotland's international exports. In addition, Mr Speaker, although this is harder to quantify, many of the products exported from Scotland to the rest of the UK, and this goes the other way as well, will form finished goods destined for the rest of the single market or countries with which the EU has an FTA. Uh, I'll come back to that because it's important. Now, of course, the rather non-exhaustive list of reasons why trade is likely to fall and drive down GDP growth includes increased cost of bureaucracy, uncertainty about the nature of customs arrangements, additional regulatory burdens, non-tariff barriers, which in some cases are the most significant, 
uncertainty about the legal basis upon which certain transactions may be carried out, and so on and so forth. Now, it's likely some of these issues will be resolved. I've got no doubt about that. But not all, not quickly, and not without cost to business and the economy. And if we look briefly at one or two of the areas or the ways in which the political agreement intends to take us forward, we can demonstrate how uncertain this is. On customs, and this is in section paragraph 27, the UK has suggested a facilitated customs arrangement, or facilitative, as it's described in this agreement. But that's broadly similar to the maximum facilitation already described as fundamentally unworkable by the European Union. On tariffs, and this is in page, uh, paragraph 23, what's said is fine in principle. But if we don't achieve that, or if there's no deal, we're left with a situation where some people who support a harder Brexit are suggesting we set all our tariffs to zero and thus increase trade. But were that to happen, and we had it confirmed yesterday in terms of the backstop, there's no guarantee it would be reciprocated, may well lead to the dumping of goods here from countries with massively lower labour costs and undermine business and jobs and <coughs> prosperity here. Absolutely. So there's absolutely nothing certain. In a sense, we're not taking a decision on an agreement. We're taking a decision on a wish list in a political statement, some or all of which may come to note. And on staff, and I've already... <clears throat> gone through what's said in the political agreement about labour, we're already seeing staff shortages, particularly in the rural economy. The UK farmers, farms take in around 60,000 workers a year on a seasonal basis. The UK government's proposal right now is for an evaluation scheme of 2,500. It doesn't cut the mustard. Now, it may be that this matter is resolved and resolved in two or three years and it's done quite successfully. The damage will be done by then. The crops will have rotted in the fields. Now, I think somebody asked earlier, asked earlier, this is all terribly bad news, it's all project fear. Is there any reason for optimism? Well, I, frankly, I, I don't think there is. I, I do not believe an FTA could adequately mitigate the damage Brexit will uh, uh, cause. The government's own assessment says an end to free movement plus an FTA would result in a decline of around 6.7% of GDP in the future. It has been argued by the UK Government's Global Britain strategy that we would offset a decline in trade with the EU from being outside the single market by exporting to more countries. However, fully replacing the value of EU trade will be challenging, I think as illustrated by the trade flows from the emerging BRIC economies – Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And I'll use these Scottish figures to demonstrate this briefly. These nations account for 2.1 billion, 7% of Scotland's exports. In comparison, the EU accounts for 12.3 billion, 43%. So even a small proportionate loss in trade or lost growth in trade with the EU would require a dramatic increase Absolutely. in trade, over 30% increase in trade with those countries. Now, we'd all love to see that happen. We'd love to see it happen across the whole of the UK. Great. May I suggest that that's uh, highly unlikely. If the UK signed agreements with the ten biggest non-EEA countries, including the USA, China and Canada, a process which could take many years, that would cover only 37 per cent of Scotland's exports, compared to the 43 which go to the EU. And some of the trade simply couldn't be substituted. If one is selling low margin, or perishable goods Absolutely. to the EU in a wagon refrigerated overnight, it simply can't be substituted by shipping the same stuff to Australia or Japan or China. It simply doesn't work like that. Mr Speaker, I say finally on trade. It's worth also pointing out that despite the government's own optimistic assumptions, even signing a substantial number of trade deals would result in an increase of less than one quarter of one per cent of GDP compared to the situation today. That was confirmed yesterday. One quarter of one per cent of GDP through increased trade if we successfully negotiate trade deals with the US, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Brunei, China, India, 
Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Arabia Oman, Kuwait and Bahrain. That is an awful lot of risk for very little potential gain. There are two uh, other areas I want briefly to talk about. The first is foreign direct investment, now a key feature of the contemporary global economy and one from which the UK and Scotland derives considerable benefits. We have seen uh, a substantial number of jobs in Scotland owned by EU companies who have invested here over the decades precisely to have access to the European market. There is no certainty at all that would stay, and in the future much of it would go. And the second point I wish to raise is productivity. The Bank of England assessment in the last week cites uh, academic evidence which shows how tariffs may force the reallocation of production towards less efficient domestic producers, lowering aggregate productivity. Sorry, that's reallocate investment towards less efficient domestic producers. So even if there is substitution, as many argue, it is likely to lower aggregate productivity. So I will give way one final time. Uh, I appreciate his generosity. Um, but does he, the evidence all shows that inward investment is about relative advantage. It is about lower corporation tax rates, more labor, flexible labour markets. It is about skilled workforce, our universities. Three to five per cent tariffs are not as important as those other factors. And I suggest he looks at the record inward investment we have seen in this country since the referendum result to prove the point. The object is right in one regard. The tariffs are important, in some areas very important. The non-tariff barriers, as I said earlier, may be more significant. We are already seeing skilled labour leave and not come back. We are already hearing our universities, he mentioned, now worried because the academic uh, working together with Europe is no longer there. And the relative advantage of an English-speaking country with access to the EU market was there for all to see. Some people now wish to rip that up. Mr Speaker, every single Brexit model is bad. Investment is likely to fall. Trade will most certainly be reduced. Barriers will be erected. People will be poorer. And productivity will be stifled. And on that basis, Mr Speaker, we need to think and we think again. And think again quickly. Because as I see today, and I will paraphrase the Prime Minister's words from another constitutional debate, there is no positive case for Brexit. Now is not the time for Brexit. And frankly, Brexit must be taken off the table. Uh -huh. yeah.